Today we're going to do a close reading of the opening passage from chapter 2 in The Great Gadsby, which describes the Valley of Ashes. Just as we do whenever we're deconstructing a passage, we're going to start by considering what is happening. Then we'll take a look at how the scene is being presented through literary devices and specific diction, and finally we'll consider why Fitzgerald has chosen to present the setting in this way to convey some greater meaning about characters and their relationships to one another. In our analytical reading today, we're going to practice the strategy of visualizing while we read. Before we begin, though, I'd like you to take a minute to go back into your book to page 23 and find the passage that's printed on your handout. In your book, go ahead and read around that passage for context to get your bearings. Flip to the pages before and after the passage and think about where these paragraphs fit in with the bigger picture of the novel. Why don't you go ahead and pause this video until you're ready to move on. Okay, let's just start by rereading the passage on the handout. Go ahead and follow along with me. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile, so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens, where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke, and finally, with a transcendent effort, of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest, and immediately the ash-gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud which screens their obscure operations from your sight. But above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over, you perceive after a moment the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose. Evidently, some wild wag of an oculist set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens, and then sank down himself into eternal blindness, or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless days under the sun and rain, brood on over the solemn dumping ground. The Valley of Ashes is bounded on one side by a small, foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as a half an hour. There is always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. Okay, so now let's go back and read it again. And this time, I'm going to share some of my thinking with you, especially about the author's words and questions that I have while I'm reading. I'm going to show you how I visualize or construct a mental picture of the setting while I read. So as we work through the passage, you should annotate your handout, marking the specific details in the text that illustrate the setting and help you make inferences about the characters associated with this setting. Feel free to pause and rewind the video as you need it. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. Huh. It seems like the narrator's highlighting how these other two places, the West Egg and New York, um, are like destinations, but the Valley of Ashes is just the place you pass through along the way. I also know that the word desolate means deserted, which seems sort of like a power word in that sentence. Um, so it's like a bleak and empty place. I guess this makes me think that the Valley of Ashes is just super depressing and that basically nobody wants to live or stay here. Okay, so let's keep reading. This is a Valley of Ashes. I'm sort of struck by this repetition of ashes. I guess I'm imagining in my mind like a whole town, or I guess a rest stop really, covered with powdery gray. I wonder why Fitzgerald chooses ash, since that's what's left over after something burns or is destroyed. 
And so it's sort of interesting to me that Nick, our narrator, is describing the whole valley as being made out of the remains of something that's been destroyed or ruined. I'm kind of wondering what's been destroyed here. What was there before? Was there ever anything good here? Um, what caused it to be ruined? Either way, this place is super depressing. Okay, so let's keep reading. Uh, so this is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens. Hmm. So the ashes are so thick that they pile up and form ridges and hills and gardens, but the gardens are grotesque. Grotesque is like beyond gross. It's something that's repulsive and distorted. So judging by Fitzgerald's diction, I guess this place, the Valley of Ashes, is super revolting. So it's depressing, it's revolting. Um, okay, so the ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys, they're so thick, and rising smoke, and finally, with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. I'm picturing an ash man, <laughs> like a man made entirely out of the burnt out dust of a life that's been destroyed. The narrator says that the ashes take the form of men and that those men move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. If this were a movie, I feel like these men would be like walking ghosts or the walking dead. I feel really sad for the people who have to make this place their home because it seems to suck the life right out of them. They become like identical to the place that they live in. Okay, so let's keep reading. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest. And immediately, the ash gray men swarm up with leaden spades, like shovels, and stir up an impenetrable cloud, or a cloud you can't see through, which screens their obscure operations from your sight. I feel like all I've seen in this whole paragraph is gray everywhere. So I'm starting to wonder if there's other gray imagery or dark and cloudy imagery that I've missed. So... What I'm going to do is I'm going to reread the paragraph from the beginning and just mark the things that are gray, dark, or ash-like. So why don't you go ahead and mark your text with me. Starting from the beginning, um, like in the third line down, I see Valley of Ashes, Fantastic Farm where ashes grow. In the next line, there's ashes again. And towards the end of that line, smoke. The next line down, men who move dimly. And then there's the powdery air at the end of that sentence. The next line down, there's gray cars, an invisible track. Um, the line beneath that is ash gray men. And then the line after that, there's an impenetrable cloud. And I'm sort of peeking ahead in the next line, I'm seeing gray land and bleak dust. Kind of wondering why Fitzgerald chose to pack this paragraph so full of gray imagery. Maybe he's trying to make me feel like overwhelmed by how gray and cloudy and ashy everything is in the Valley of Ashes. Maybe that's what it's like to live there, that everywhere you go, you're trapped in this awful, dismal, dreary, gray heap. Okay, let's take a little time out for a sec. I want you to think strategically. How have I been using the analytical reading strategy of visualizing in this opening paragraph of the passage? Why don't you pause the video while you think and make a quick note to yourself and then restart when you're ready to go. Okay, before we move on to the next paragraph, I want to take a second listen to some of the sounds in this opening passage. I feel like I keep repeating the S and the SH sound a lot. So let's go back and reread those first two sentences and see what Fitzgerald is doing here. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile, so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens, where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke, and finally, with a transcendent effort 
of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Okay, I was right. There was a lot of S and SH sounds here. So I know that repetition of a consonant sound is called alliteration, but these are all S and SH sounds. And so I know that's a fancy kind of alliteration called sibilance. Sibilance even uses sibilance, which is kind of cool. What's weird, though, about Fitzgerald's use of sibilance in this passage, when I look at it this way, is it seems like there's a pattern. Like there's a bunch of s sounds, and then like a sh and then a s s and another sh sh and then s and another s and then it goes s Wait a second. Is he doing what I think he's doing? Let's try saying this one more time. Go with me for a second. I think he wrote a train into the sound of this passage. How cool is that? Okay, let's pick up with the next paragraph. But above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over it, you perceive after a moment the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic, their retinas are one yard high, and they look out of no face. I'm actually kind of confused by this image, and it's kind of creepy. <laughs> There's like these giant eyes. So not only are there these like ghost men, ash men, but there are also these spooky giant eyes floating out on the horizon of this gray, bleak land. I'm not totally sure what's happening, so I'm going to read around this section here and see if I can figure it out. It looks like the eyes are so big that the retinas, that black part in the middle, are a full yard high, like three feet tall. And they're looking out through this gigantic pair of glasses over a non-existent face. So they look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose. Evidently some wild wag of an oculist, I had to look this one up, an oculist, was a term that was used back in the 1920s for an optometrist or an eye doctor. So he's describing this guy, Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, as a wild wag of an eye doctor. And he put up this giant set of glasses in the Valley of Ashes to fatten his practice. I think that means he's trying to get more business. Like, it's an advertisement, I guess. So at first I thought these floating eyes were like a mirage or an optical illusion, but... Now I'm starting to picture in my mind that these giant glasses are maybe on a billboard of some sort. And it looks like Dr. Eckelberg forgot about this billboard and just left it up for a really long time. Because the next line, so he says, sank down into eternal blindness or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, the eyes of the billboard, dimmed a little by many paintless days under the sun and rain, brewed on over the solemn dumping ground. So the result is this last line, that the eyes of the billboard keep looking out over the solemn dumping ground that characterizes the Valley of Ashes. And the eyes are brooding or thinking very deeply about something that makes them unhappy. They may literally be a billboard advertising an eye doctor who forgot about his billboard, but more figuratively, they kind of make me think about the eyes of God. Like these eyes are watching out over us, except these eyes are dim, and look out on a lifeless ash heap, which is basically the opposite of how I think of God watching over us. I wonder what the billboard is supposed to symbolize. I know that billboards are meant to sell things and that the eyes are sort of godlike, but I'm not sure yet how those two things relate. Okay, time out. Let's take a look at patterns for a second. How did I arrive at the conclusion that the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are on a billboard and have something to do with God. I want you to pause the video while you think and make a quick note to yourself about how I picked up on these patterns, and then go ahead and restart when you're ready to go. Okay, 
So we have these brooding eyes over the solemn dumping ground. The last paragraph. The Valley of Ashes is bounded on one side by a small foul river. Now this is kind of messing with my image of the beautiful town nestled in a valley with the river on one side. I usually think of rivers as life-giving, like in that opening scene of Chocolat, how the river brings in new people with new ideas. But this river is like the opposite of that. It's small and foul and stagnant, and the water is probably contaminated with ash. Okay, so the Valley of Ashes is bounded on one side by a small, foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as a half an hour. There's always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. Okay, so at the end of Nick's description of this hell-like setting, we find out that this is the place that he first meets Tom's mistress, Myrtle. Wow, all I can think of right now is how different this place is from where Tom lives in East Egg. So we just finished chapter one, like the page before this is chapter one, and we're seeing glitz and glamour in the Buchanan's house, and it's basically all clean and white and gold and glimmering in the sunlight. And then here we are, we turn the page, and we're in this dull, gray, smoky, lifeless, awful place. I know from other books like The Scarlet Letter that setting is often used to reveal something about characters who live there. So I'm starting to think that there's literally a world of difference between Tom and his mistress Myrtle. I'm starting to wonder how they met and what her life is like and what she wants and whether or not she can get out of here and how she and Tom are connected and what Tom sees in the relationship with Myrtle and what she sees in the relationship with Tom. I'm also wondering why Fitzgerald would choose to juxtapose these two settings so closely, like right next to each other. Turn the page and here's a new setting. Why is he trying to highlight the stark contrast between these two locations? Okay, time out. Let's put these ideas in your own words. What do you think Fitzgerald is trying to get us to think about the characters who live in the Valley of Ashes through his description of the setting? Go ahead and pause the video while you think and make a quick note to yourself and then restart when you're ready to go. Okay, now it's your turn. Now that you've reread this passage with me and we've considered what's happening in the scene and how the scene has been constructed through literary devices, it's time to think about why. What's the so what of these opening paragraphs in chapter two? Is it just a gray little town? Or, more likely... Does it help us to understand something bigger?